tonight to learn about this amazing um, river cruise in this part of the world. I, I think you're going to be in for a real treat. Um, we have uh, Todd Nay. Is that how you pronounce it, Todd? You bet. Nay. Okay. Like um, he's the uh, he's the I'm a expert when it comes to the Nile River and Africa, and he's going to talk us through their um, great optional uh, options with their their Nile River cruises. Um, and also the other voice you hear is Mary Margaret Ruther. She's our account manager with um, AMA. And uh, she works hand in, in glove with um, all of our advisors in helping get the best um, booked for all of you, our clients, um, on, a, on a wonderful AMA waterways uh, river cruise. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mary Margaret now. And then at the end, we will, um, I'll just kind of remind everybody how you can get in touch with your local Birch Travel Advisor or your Pegasus Advisor to check on uh, these wonderful cruises, check pricing, check availability and all of that. So I'm gonna mute and, and uh, drop off of here, just uh, mute out of here and I'll turn it over to Mary Margaret. Okay, thank you Gretchen very much. And um, welcome everyone. Yes, I'm, I'm Mary Margaret and I am in the Midwest, yes. So I know the weather situation, unlike Todd, who's in uh, La La Land, as I like to say, uh, L.A. Um, Todd, you can change this, change the set. Uh, okay. What I, I just want to say a few things before Todd does his presentation. And I think this this slide really says it all as far as the financial um wherewithal of um, waterways. We are a financially sound company. This the uh, ships that you see on the right hand side of your screen, we own them. They're paid for. Uh, we have no debt. So that when you're working with Burst Travel and they're working with AMA Waterways, you're working with a very financially sound company. You know, the AMA Serena was supposed to be put in the water last year. Unfortunately, it was not, but it is in the water now getting its final touches as is the AMA Lucia. And the Amadelia, which Todd will talk a lot about, is absolutely going to be beautiful for Egypt. But the two ships that I want to point out especially are the Amabella and the Amaverte, because we weren't just sitting on our hands in, in 2020 as far as ships. The Amabella and the Amaverte were our first two twin balcony ships put in the water in 2010 and 11. And I was on the Amabella in 12. And that ship is absolutely, was absolutely beautiful. Well, we've totally gutted those two ships and they're like brand new ships. That's why they have two dates next to them. So again, AMA Waterways and welcome to the AMA family. Next slide, please. As far as the protocols, you know, we, we don't know what the protocols are going to be this year when we do start to sail. Uh, please make note amawaterways.com slash protocols for the most up-to-date protocols that we are aware of that the countries have and the governments have given us. But we did sail last summer for a German tour operator with German, Swiss, and um, uh, um, um, sorry, in Germans. So what we had to do was we had face coverings. Uh, our crew had face coverings 24-7. Our guests um, last summer wore face coverings in the public areas and as they were going down to the dining area. Uh, we temperature checks were uh, for the crew were constantly taken and for our guests at the time when they arrived on ship and when they went down for breakfast and luggage was sanitized um, you know prior to being put in their staterooms and social distancing was you know, we have the quiet box system. So when everyone is on tour, you don't have to be up close and personal with your tour guide or the people that you're with. But I think what saved us because we had not one, not one episode of COVID uh, from July 2nd to November 2nd is the clean air of, a, of the ships. When Rudy has designed our ships and Rudy Schneider is one of our co-founders, he's our president architect. And he's also known as the godfather of river cruising. He, every single ship from the get-go, from the Amadagio, our first ship, has individual systems. So every stateroom, every hallway, every lobby, every restaurant you know, that we have on our ships is, all has a separate system. So you're breathing clean air. Next slide, please. So I'm going to turn this over to Todd. 
our product manager for Egypt and the Nile, as well as for Africa. Enjoy the journey, and I can't wait to go. Take it away, Todd. Okay, uh, howdy folks, and once again, I'm Todd, and I'm the product manager here at Amal Waterways for a couple of destinations over in Africa. And um, so today I'm gonna to talk to you about our new program on in Egypt and the Nile River, and then we'll head down to the southern portion of Africa, the Chobe River, down around Botswana, South Africa, and Namibia. So let's first start with Egypt and uh, Egypt itself, uh, location in the northeastern corner or of uh, Af the continent of Africa. We got the Mediterranean to the north, Red Sea to the uh, east. And on the map here, I've got Israel, Jordan, and the UAE or United Arab Emirates, uh, Dubai, uh, because those are extensions that you can do before and after the trip. And if you look at the map there down, um, you see uh, just north of Sudan is uh, Abu Simbel. Pay attention to that and I'll talk about that uh, later on in the trip or pay attention to the location. All right, our program in Egypt is 12 days, 11 nights, 12 days. And we start with three nights in Cairo at the beginning. And then we'll fly down to Luxor. That flight takes about an hour. And then we'll board our new ship, the Amadalia, uh, in Luxor for a seven night cruise. And, uh, run, uh, and then we'll fly back to Cairo for one more night. We start sailing in Egypt this September, beginning of September, and our cruises are every week through the end of the year. And then we continue through January and June of next year, as well as September and December. And uh, because of demand and the ships are all filling up so quickly, we've, we're going to open up for sale for 2023 in about three weeks. Okay, so let's talk about Cairo. You remember I said that we start with three nights in Cairo. And... Uh, Cairo itself is a massive city, kind of chaotic, but still a fascinating city. Uh, population 22, 23 million people. Cairo itself is, uh, it's an Arabic word that means conquer. And uh, just some, some little facts about Egypt and Cairo in itself. Um, weekends in Egypt are Fridays and Saturdays. And uh, Egypt was founded around 3100 BC. Uh, and a kind of a fun fact, it was the Egyptians that came up with the 365 day year calendar. Through the heart of Cairo is the Nile River and they say that's the longest river in the world. Uh, but sometimes they say the Amazon is the longest river in the world. So I'm really not quite sure which is, but in either case, both are around 4,300 miles long. And the Nile originates up in uh, Lake Victoria and Ethiopia with the blue and the white Niles and they merge into one, the Nile here, and that uh, flows into the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, uh, this is our new ship, the Amadalia on the Nile. And when I say new, it is new, kind of, sort of, would have, I guess, or something, but the way it works in Egypt is, um, there are no more licenses allowed being issued on to cruise the Nile. They only want a certain amount of ships and that's it. So the only way for us to uh, start cruising on the Nile was to purchase a ship in which we did about three years ago. And we took that ship out of service and uh, we put it into a shipyard in Cairo and we stripped it right down to its hull and rebuilt it from the top. An actual, it's taken uh, two years in the shipyard and we actually just launched it on the Nile in Cairo uh, last week. And uh, now we've got the next eight months to prepare the crew and so on like that before we start sailing in uh, September. The Amadaya, Daya is a plant or flower that does grow in Egypt. The ship itself, 34 cabins. And actually let's look at the layout and I'll explain it all to you. So here's the layout of the Amadalia. Um, we start on the acacia deck. Actually, all the decks are named after plants or flowers, again, in Egypt. And the acacia deck is the lowest deck. Um, these are the uh, cabins with a picture, large picture window, about 196 square feet. Work your way up to the lotus lily deck. Uh, cabins are larger. The purple section is category C. They come with a French balcony, and a French balcony is it's a balcony, but you really can't stand out on it, but you have large sliding glass windows or doors. So it's kind of like you have, um, it's kind of like you, you get a lot of fresh air that comes into the room. And then we have suites, 16 of them on uh, there. Um, green, turquoise, the navy blue and the pink, those are all suites and they range in size from 370 to uh, 
430 square feet, and they all come with uh, balconies and or French balcony. And then up on the jasmine deck, uh, we have a, uh, a fitness room and a massage and hair salon. I should also mention we will have a, uh, a wellness coach. So those that like to do exercise routines each day and stuff, that will be available. There'll be yoga, Pilates, all kinds of different things. And uh, um, just to keep the adrenaline going. We also have what we call the chef's table and the chef's table is a, a smaller restaurant, only eight seats. 13 to 15 guests and uh, each day on the seven night cruise, 15 up to 15 guests will be invited to the chef's restaurant. Um, and there they'll have an intimate meal with the chef. You'll prepare the food, they'll talk about the food, where it's come from, the flavors, et cetera. And it's all prepared in front of you. It's a great uh, uh, evening and every guest on the ship will be invited to the chef's table um, at least once. I should also point out that the Yamadaya will have an elevator from the Acacia deck all the way up to the Jasmine deck. So let's take a look at the uh, some of the pictures of the Yamadaya. Uh, Here we go with the top deck and notice that you can kind of see uh, a lot of canopies, uh, shading and stuff on the top deck and the reason for that is Egypt is a dry climate, very sunny climate, particularly down on the, uh, the Nile where we'll be sailing and um, how dry is it? Well, this kind of tells you when I was in Egypt last and I was with our um, Egypt, one of our Egyptologists, Dina, and I looked at the landscape and I go, gosh, this is really dry. And I said, Dina, when was the last time it rained here? And she goes, she looked at me and kind of with a weird face, like nobody asked that type of question because she said, I have no idea, maybe 17 or 19 years ago. So that kind of tells you how dry it is. And Cairo, which is farther north, may only get a couple of inches of rain a year. So don't forget your sunscreen and your sun hat. Outdoor restaurant, uh, we'll have this on the top deck uh, for outdoor dining during your cruise. And here is the lobby. Uh, when you went for the Yamadaya, it's got, you've got your Egyptian thing. This is our lounge. And in our lounge, we will um, uh, have entertainment. Actually, one of the things we'll be doing is called uh, what is a sip and sail. Sip and sail is like a happy hour where um, for an hour before dinner starts, we will have a, a complimentary drinks or uh, like local wine and local beer um, or maybe a cocktail of the day or something, some sort of little um, get together happy hour before dinner. And then after dinner, there'll always be entertainment in the lounge certain things like maybe there'll be a captain's cocktail party or we'll have a belly dance show, um, things like a galabaya party, which is actually a party where you dress up as the locos, Darawish show, which is folklore music and dancing and so on. So all kinds of things that will go on in the lounge. The restaurant um, will be able to cater to um, all different types of cuisine, uh, 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 sorry, not cuisine, um, preferences, there'll be gluten, dairy-free, vegan, vegetarian, whatever it is, you just need to let us know about the time of booking and uh, we'll take care of it. Also, uh, with lunch and dinner, local wine and local beer are always included. And um, people say, well, first of all, local beer in Egypt, usually it's a brand called Stella. Um, local wine in Egypt, you don't think of Egypt as having a big wine industry and they really don't. They do have some vineyards, but not that many. And so what they have to do is import grapes in from uh, South Africa and they mix all the grapes together and there you have your uh, local wine. So local wine and local beer complimentary during uh, lunch and dinner. Um, also, the food will be sort of like Egyptian slash Mediterranean as well as continental. And continental is kind of what you're used to eating Europe or here in uh, North America. And just for hygiene regions, vast majority of the food will be uh, imported from Europe. So let's look at the, the rooms. This, uh, this is a suite, uh, anywhere from 370 to 430 square feet. The suites will come with two beds or one bed. You just need to let us know at the time um, of booking. And each suite will have a sitting room. And I should mention, whether you're in a suite or a regular cabin, always complimentary to Wi-Fi, um, as well as on-demand TV. This is kind of like an aerial view looking down into a suite. And also in the suites, uh, they will come with a walk-in shower, full tub. And what I didn't realize uh, 
but it is important to a lot of guests is that each suite, all 16 of them, will come with two sinks. The middle of the road category is uh, what was just called category C, um, 226 square feet, big size cabin, and that'll come with your French balcony. And then in the lowest category, uh, well, category E and D, they're still really nice, 196 square feet, and you can see the large picture window, lots of storage, not, no issues on here. All right, so let's, um, let's all talk about the program itself. So the way it works in Egypt is if you're coming from North America, you're gonna fly to Cairo and most flights into Cairo arrive late in the afternoon or early evening. We will meet you at the airport and we'll assist you through immigration. Um, you do need a visa for Egypt. The visas currently are $25. And uh, the way it works is you just go online and apply for your visa. We'll give you the website link and stuff like that in your documents, pay your $25, and then just bring your confirmation when you fly to uh, Egypt. Again, we'll meet you before immigration, get you through immigration, get your bag, and we'll transfer you immediately to the hotel. Yes, you can get a uh, visa on arrival, but it really slows up your uh, time through immigration. So after a long flight, you kind of want to get to the hotel as fast as you can. Um, in terms of medication and stuff like that, there's no mandatory shots, malaria or anything like that um, for Egypt and this part of the world. So anyways, you've arrived. We're going to transfer you to the hotel. This is the hotel we use in uh, Cairo. It's called the Four Seasons Hotel, five-star hotel at the first residence. And if you remember that first photo I showed you where we kind of looked downtown Cairo, I said it was kind of chaotic. This hotel is like about a mile south of that area because we wanted to sort of pick an area of the city that's central, but sort of offers a bit of peace and tranquility. And if you can see the green vegetation over on the right-hand side of the hotel, that's, those are actually, this hotel's across the street from the botanical gardens. Hotel itself comes with uh, 200 rooms overlooking the Nile. Actually, let's take a look at the rooms. These are the rooms and uh, they're called superior rooms and all the rooms that we uh, you'll be seeing we work with contract are superior rooms and they all come with a partial Nile view. Um, rooms come with a uh, complimentary to Wi-Fi and if you're familiar with your Bose music systems, each room is equipped with a Bose music system. So here's the interior of the hotel. And uh, you can see why I kind of said there's a sense of tranquility uh, at the hotel. Like there's, you don't know, there's a big city of 22 million outside the hotel. Hotel is actually uh, connected to a, a small shopping mall also. Uh, if you go to any, many websites, you'll find the, uh, the Four Seasons at the First Residence is the number one rated hotel in Cairo. And it's got, it's got a spa, of course, it's got the pool. Um, across the street from the botanical gardens and the hotel also has six restaurants and each restaurant is equipped has uh, caters to a different cuisine from around the world so when we're in cairo we always include breakfast we always include lunch but we don't include dinner simply because of the fact there's so many places to eat um, at the hotel and some of you may want to venture out so on day one, you've arrived, you've got through immigration, we take you to the hotel, nothing planned that evening because most of you will be arriving in the evening. Go to your room, get a great night's sleep, and then the next day we're gonna head out and we're gonna start a sightseeing of Cairo. And the first place we're gonna go to is called the, well, the Egyptian Museum. Old museum built back in the early 1900s. And uh, this is the museum where you'll find the mask of King Tut. And King Tut, he ruled Egypt. Actually, they found the mask in 1925, but King Tut ruled Egypt from 1332 BC to 1322 BC. So for about 10 years, kind of amazing that King Tut was nine when he started, began to rule Egypt. And um, he died at the age of 19. And uh, so he ruled Egypt for 10 years, very, very young. How did he die? They're not really sure, but most people say now that he probably died in a chariot race. So we're gonna to tour the museum and to get some free time and stuff, but I should mention they are building a brand new museum in Cairo. It's called the Grand Museum. And uh, it was supposed to be completed in 2019 and it got delayed and then 2020 got delayed again. Now they're saying it should be open uh, later on uh, this year. And the Grand Museum will house all the exhibits that you found in the regular museum, along with 30,000 more additional and 
I always have a hard time saying that, antiquities. So 30,000 things that have never been seen by the public before. So I sometimes I say artifacts, but antiquity. So we'll spend a lot of time out at the, the museum exploring it. And uh, after that, we'll head down to the souk area where um, a lot of the locals sell their wares. Uh, one of the areas we go, it's Khan El Khalili Market. This is where you'll get your real local experience in Cairo. A lot of the artisans live here, the craftsmen. Um, this area has kind of been settled in Cairo since the 10th century. Um, there's, what you also find in here are a lot of coffee houses. And what's remarkable about Egypt is um, coffee houses in Egypt have been around since the like 1760. And if you think about it, Starbucks came out in the US, I don't know, the 1990s and uh, it's a big thing. And there's still a big thing, coffee bean, caribou coffee, stuff like that. But the Egyptians were going to coffee houses way back in the 1700s. We'll also have a fantastic lunch down here in the marketplace, a uh, local meal, five-star food. And um, it's a great day. We'll do a walking tour of the market and stuff like that. And we'll head back to the hotel. You've got a free evening. And then the next day, we'll head out to the pyramids. The pyramids, um, one of the man-made natural wonders of the world or man-made wonders of the world. Each, uh, the pyramids themselves, made of made up to two to three million blocks. Those blocks weigh anywhere from one to two tons. And those blocks to build the pyramids were brought downstream on the Nile over 500 miles. How did they transport blocks weighing one to two tons? I have no idea. And then transport them over land to build the pyramids. How long did it take to build the pyramids? Anywhere from, they say 10 to 30 years. I'm thinking more like 20 to 30 years. They're built around uh, 2600 BC and pyramids themselves up to about 7, 488 feet high. A lot of people do ask, can we go inside the pyramids because they are tombs? And the answer is for the most part, no. Occasionally they'll do open the entrance, but even if they, it is open, uh, there's a guy there stand there, um, charge you like 25 or 30 bucks to get in, to walk in, but to get in, you kind of, you have to crawl in and then go down some steep stairs and sometimes turn sideways and stuff down a long, long, dark um, sort of type hallway into the tomb in the center of the pyramid. Um, but for the most part, I would say 95% of the time during the year, it is an open, but don't worry, you'll be going to another really cool tomb on the trip. So those are the pyramids. And a lot of people do ask, well, the other question is, can I do a camel ride in Egypt? And the answer is yes. Uh, we don't include it. In fact, camels aren't even native to Egypt. But if you do want to ride a camel, this is the place to do it around the pyramids. And uh, usually there'll be camels and their own, uh, owners and with their camels walking around offering rides for a dollar. And uh, so you'll get on the camel, we'll walk you around for about 10 or 15 minutes, get pictures of yourself on the camel and stuff. And then they'll say $14 to get off. So in actual fact, it's about $15 for a camel ride today anyways. Um, the other neat thing we're gonna do is head over to the Sphinx and um, the Sphinx itself makes it remarkable. Built around the same time as the pyramids, the head is that of a king, body of a, a, a lion. Uh, the king in this case was King Khafre and uh, King Khafre was a uh, 2,500 years ago. And how long did it build, take to build the Sphinx? Probably about three years. And it must, makes it remarkable. The head of a head, a head of a king, body of a lion, it's all carved out of one stone. Then we're going to head down after we've spent, explored the pyramids and the Sphinx, we'll head over to the Mena House. And the Mena House is a really cool property. Um, it used to be a hunting lodge and it was built back in the 1860s and the architecture is actually spectacular. And um, so we'll head over to the Mena House, um, have a, a five-star lunch there. The Mena House itself, it is, the architecture is amazing. They have added on to a, a hotel to the Mena House, but uh, it does have its uh, original aura. In fact, back in the 1860s, 70, 1870, Europeans used to come down to Cairo uh, hunters and they would stay at the Mena House and they would hunt hippos and um, 
crocodiles in the delta of the Nile. Of course, that doesn't happen today. After that, we're gonna visit a synagogue in Cairo, a church, and we'll head back to the hotel. And then you're gonna have a free night. And then we're gonna to head to the airport and we're gonna fly down to Luxor. And we'll arrive in Luxor in the late morning and then we'll transfer to the Amadalia. We have our own private dock in Luxor. And we'll board the ship, check into your room, have a great lunch, and then we start to explore Luxor. And Luxor was the ancient capital of Egypt. It's known as the, probably the world's greatest outdoor uh, living museum. And um, first place we're gonna visit when we're in Luxor is the Luxor Temple. And Luxor Temple built around 1400 BC. And so we're gonna visit temples and tombs along the Nile. And people ask, well, how do you tour these temples and tombs and stuff like that? So this is the way it works on the AMA program. 68 guests on our ship. Um, the group guests are gonna be split up into three groups of 20 to 23 guests. You get your own Egyptologist in that group for the whole trip from Cairo on the cruise and then back to Cairo at the end of the trip. The Egyptologists, they're university educated. They have a special license from the government and they really do know what they're uh, talking about. So it's kind of like the familiarity that you'll have the same guide throughout your whole trip. Walking tours of the temples or tombs take anywhere from one hour to two hours. Is there a dress code? No, not really. Just, you know, just a dry climate. So sun hat, t-shirt, shorts is fine. Uh, maybe uh, long socks in the winter and a light coat. Um, the other issue was uh, in terms of like, if I have some mobility issues, will I be able to tour all the temples? And the answer is kind of like, I'm not sure, uh, mainly because the temples are the way they were, you know, 2,500 years ago, you know, 2,000 years ago. They haven't been upgraded with ramps, hand railings, or seating and stuff. It's the way they were. And so those that do have some mobility, mobility challenges, um, we'll do our best to try to get you through the temples and stuff. But in some cases, uh, if you're wheelchair and stuff like that, it's physically impossible to get a wheelchair into the temple. So if, there, if you do have some mobility challenges, just travel with an open mind and know that we'll do our best to get you to see as much as you can. One of the really cool tombs that we're gonna visit in on, on the Nile is called the, Queen, the tomb of Queen Nefertari. And who is Queen Nefertari? Um, she was the first wife of King Ramses II. She was the most beautiful, she was smart, well-educated, she could read and she could write. She married King Ramses at the age of 13 and he was uh, 15. She died at the age of 45 approximately. He actually lived to like, 66, some say up to his early 90s. In any case, that's like 150 in today's years. Um, Queen Nefertari, this tomb was basically ignored up until the 1980s. And then they kind of started going in and digging around it. And this is kind of what they found. And the very few people get to go in this tomb. It's kind of open to the public now, but kind of exclusive. And cruise companies don't include it because I'm be honest with you, the cost to get into this tomb um, $120, $130 per person. It's included with AMA, but that's why most companies don't include it, cruise companies, because of the expense. So we're going to get aside, you're going to be able to spend time in the tomb. The tomb itself, 5,500 square feet, and it's really cool is once you're inside, uh, you'll see little stories and poems and so on written by King Ramses to Queen Nefertari. Another neat uh, temple that we'll uh, visit is the Temple of Horus. And the Temple of Horus is one of the best preserved temples. And um, why is it one of the best preserved? Well, way back in the 1860s, there was an archeologist in this part of the world digging around looking for temples, tombs, whatever. And he came across something hard in the ground and kept digging. I'm kind of simplifying the story and uh, kept digging. And this is what he found, the Temple of Horus. And what he was digging through was a sand dune. So this thing was completely covered by a desert sand dune and nobody even knew it was there. And that's why it's so well uh, preserved today. The Nile itself, what's interesting about Egypt is that the Egyptians never said sunrise and they didn't say sunset. They said the birth of the day 
or the death of the day. And why is that? And well, you know, the sun comes up, it's the birth of the day. So when you're in Egypt, you'll find the temples are on the east side of the Nile, birth of the day. You'll find the tombs on the west side of the Nile or the death of the day. Along the way, uh, we're gonna stop at an island. We'll visit a really unique Nubian village. And who are the Nubians? Well, they settled in Egypt probably around 8,000 BC. Egyptians settled in around 3,500 BC. So the Nubians were in Egypt 5,000 years before the Egyptians. Where did they come from? Probably central, uh, the central Sahara. Uh, you could compare the Nubians say to the um, indigenous here in the United States or First Nations in Canada, the Inuit up in the Arctic. And um, what's really neat about the Nubians, they settled on all the different islands. And uh, if you see, they're very colorful and all, their homes have these carvings and drawings on the outside. And it's just not just because they like to draw and uh, carve and stuff like that. What you don't really see is that the family in that home is actually telling you a story or the history of their family. So it's kind of, so there's a meaning behind each decoration on the home. When we visit the Nubian villas, uh, this is a good way to get up close and personal uh, with the Nubians. So we'll do a walking tour with the locals. We'll visit the spice market. Um, and then other companies visit different Nubian villages um, they, you, and they're on, they'll visit for 40 minutes and you head back to the boat. But we're actually gonna take it one step further and we'll have lunch with the Nubians in their village. Um, there's a, one optional trip on uh, down here in, uh, Egypt, and it's to Abu Simbel. I told, spoke about it earlier. Abu Simbel is about 100, 200 miles south of our southernmost destination on the Nile, Aswan. And the only way to get there is by um, a plane. It's about a 40 minute flight in a jet. But the history of Abu Simbel is pretty remarkable. It was built by King Ramses, built it on the shores of uh, uh, the Nile or Queen Nefertari. And, you know, it was used for maybe a thousand years or so, and then it was eventually abandoned. And then back in the late 50s, early um, 1960s, they built a dam inside Aswan, and, or just outside Aswan, the Aswan Dam. The lake behind it was going to be uh, the Lake Nasser. And as the water began to fill up, it was going to cover this Temple Abu symbol. And uh, so this is such an amazing structure. The government decided to save it. And they took the, the temple apart, brick by brick by brick, and moved it up the hill 900 feet and rebuilt it again. And you kind of, if you look in the center there, you see that doorway and there's a guy standing there to the left-hand side. So you can actually see how big this structure is. And what's, remember how I said that King Ramses uh, ordered this temp to be built. And um, so on February 21st and October 21st of each year, as the sun comes over the horizon, the first rays shine through that door and directly to a statue of King Ramses. I don't know how they figured it out, the math, the moon, the stars, whatever they did, but they managed to build it to, for February 21st and October 22nd. Why on those dates? February 21st, King Ramses' birthday. October 21st, coronation of King Ramses. So this is an optional trip. And uh, so the reason I put that this in here is because um, Ships do sell it as an optional trip and uh, you, you buy it when you're on a cruise, but it's first come first serve because the number of uh, seats sold to go see Abu Simbel um, is uh, limited to the number of seats on the plane. So, but with online waterways, if you do want to go see um, Abu Simbel, you can pre-book it with us. So you're guaranteed a seat um, uh, on the flight down to see Abu Simbel. The whole trip takes about four hours, 40 minutes, flying down there two hours at the temple and then uh, 40 minutes back. So I would say the first time I ever saw Abu Simbel, um, you get that feeling like, well, you haven't seen it yet, I guess, but first time you see the pyramids, you know, something you've seen all your life but never got to see. It's like maybe you've seen the Great Wall of China, I mean, even the Grand Canyon or like Machu Picchu. That feeling you get when you've seen something that magnificent. This is what, ha this is what happens at Abu Simbel. Another neat temple along the way is Komombo, and Komombo is about 30 miles north of Aswan, and we'll stop here, and this temple is dedicated to Solbeck, who was a crocodile god, and Horus, who was the 
uh, falcon head god. And you can kind of see the entrance of the two of the temple there on the left and the right. And um, what makes this temple really interesting is that this is where you'll find a lot of mummified crocodiles. The largest temple that you'll tour is Karnak Temple. And you just look at the columns here. This is the temple where it will probably take about two hours to do your walking tour with your Egyptologist. Um, this was the place to be or to be seen back in ancient Egypt. They spent you know, over a period of 1500 years, they kept adding on and adding on uh, to this uh, temple. They say it's now the largest religious outdoor facility found, out, found anywhere in the world. So it's pretty remarkable and uh, we save it for last. Um, so because we're going through a lot on this uh, itinerary, um, so I have to keep going moving forward. And so we've just spent seven nights on the Nile visiting the temples, uh, the tombs, villages and so on like that. And then we're going to fly back to Cairo for your last night. And if you remember, if you go to Europe and stuff like that, you know, you're explore the cities and stuff. You see a lot of churches, spectacular um, palaces, alleyways and stuff like that. And then maybe by the ninth, 10th day, you know, they're still great, but wouldn't it be nice to see something a little different? Maybe that's the feeling you're gonna get down here after spending seven nights in the Nile, temples, tombs, villages. So we're gonna fly back to Cairo for the last night. And we're gonna actually get there in the around noon and head to the presidential palace. Again, this is something that's really very few people get to go in. Companies avoid it because of the cost, but it's included with on the waterways. This is the Abdeen Palace or the Presidential Palace, and it was built uh, back around 1873. And this is where the president lives. And when dignitaries, oh, well, actually, it was built for the monarchy at the time. Um, private residence and part of the palace now. And this is when dignitaries come from around the world. They'll stay here at the Abdeen or Presidential Palace. In this palace, there's a, little, a couple of small museums. There's an old clock museum, art museum. It's even a little museum to uh, you know, displays all the little the gifts that dignitaries have brought over the last 150 years to Egypt. So we'll do a walking tour of the palace, and um, we're going to stay there. Actually, we're not just going to leave. We're actually going to take it one step further, and we're going to have a, a, a farewell lunch or lunch at the palace. And we're going to have a farewell lunch rather than a farewell dinner. A lot of companies like to celebrate the last night with the dinner and party and stuff like that. But because the flights back to North America tend to be very early in Cairo, five, six, seven o'clock, we thought let's do our celebration in the afternoon rather than in the evening. So we'll do our celebration here at the Presidential Palace. And um, we will head back to the hotel that night. We'll stop in Old Cairo on the way. Next day, on the very last day of your trip in Cairo, uh, we'll transfer you back to the airport in uh, on time in time for your flight home. So that's kind of like our 12-day trip uh, into Egypt, and um, we're going to keep going here. And um, I like to do a couple of recommendations if you're really interested in Egypt. There's a new documentary that just came out about four months ago. It's called on Netflix, "The Secrets of the Saqqara Tomb," and these tombs were found uh, just recently found. And they started excavating them back in uh, 2019. They're near the uh, ancient pyramids. And this documentary films the process of them entering the tomb, getting into the tomb, digging it out and so on uh, to find out what they were gonna find. The documentary is over a period of a year and several months until you know finally get to the center part of the tomb and what do they find? I'm not gonna tell you what they find, but the suspense continues right through to the end of the documentary, well worth watching. Okay, um, take a little water there. Uh, as I said, one, one of the options that you can do before uh, Egypt is four nights in Jordan. And four nights in Jordan includes two nights in Amman. Amman itself, you'll fly into Amman. We get the visa for you on arrival. We'll take you to the hotel. Everything's included, you're handheld the whole way through. We do a historic tour of Amman and, uh, and we'll head out. Uh, the hotel we'll stay at is uh, the St. Regis, a five-star hotel. And then we'll also spend two nights, well, two nights in Amman, two nights in Petra. And you all know the site here. This is the treasury at uh, Petra. Petra uh, site was famous. What in that movie, what was it called? 
Indiana Jones and the Crusades, now, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So Petra itself founded back around 5000 BC and um, it be, was a thriving civilization for about 7,000, over 5,000 years. And then around the second century, uh, it, it was abandoned. And at, at the time, it probably 30 to 50,000 people lived here. You know, 800 structures, including the tre treasury here. Why was it abandoned? Several reasons. Um, they had built this conduit system to bring water down from the mountains where there was snow into the city and the city could thrive because they had so much water. But then there was drought, the water dried up, earthquakes and a change in trading routes and the place was abandoned. And then it was discovered again by a, a, a Swiss tourist back around 1820 and became a world uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site that had been 1980. So we'll spend two nights in uh, Petra, and then after that, you'll fly back, fly to Cairo to join your trip uh, through Egypt. The other option is three nights in Dubai. And Dubai itself, crazy city, built out of nothing, out of, off the Persian Gulf, into a city of incredible skyscrapers, architecture, some of it magnificent, some of it amazing. You could say some of it is uh, cheesy, but it's still a cool place to see. And I'll give you an example, like how over the top it can be. Um, well, first of all, we, I was with one of our guides in the middle of July. We don't go to Dubai in July, but it is a, a very hot, 115 degrees. And we were exploring Dubai and I said to our guide, I go, gosh, you know, I just can't take this heat. I'm not used to it. And we get out of the heat and he goes, let's go to the mall. And I said, mm, I don't know, I'm not really into malls, stuff like that, shopping, maybe a thrift store, but not a mall. And he goes, no, this mall is different. So we went to the mall and I walked in and right to the left was this massive indoor ski hill. Um, and so it was 117 degrees outside or 115. We walk in this mall and there's this ski hill with snow and people skiing in the middle of summer in this mall in Dubai, 115 degrees. So growing up on the West Coast of Canada, I was a big ski fan. I skied all my life, university and stuff like that. So I ditched the exploring the Dubai and research and we spent the next three hours skiing on a mountain in Dubai in a shopping mall in the middle of the summer. Kind of cool. Um, also in Dubai, we'll head out to the desert and we'll do a Jeep tour in the desert. And we'll also head down to Abu Dhabi, uh, explore Abu Dhabi, it's about 80 miles southwest of uh, Dubai. And uh, we'll also, when we're Abu Dhabi, we'll visit the Zaid Grand Mosque, a spectacular mosque. It's not old, built in the 1980s. You'll be there on a Thursday, but if we were there on a Friday, you'd be in that um, mosque along with 40,000 other worshipers. So that's Dubai. And your final offer option is Israel for four nights. And you can visit Jerusalem for four nights after your trip to uh, Egypt. And we kind of like uh, um, touch on everything. I mean, if you're a Christian, it's really important to you. It's your history and so on like that. You're going to go to Israel for 10 days, two weeks. Jewish and uh, you want to explore your Jewish heritage and history and stuff like that, you'll probably go to Israel for, uh, again, 10 days, two weeks. What we're trying to do is just touch on a little bit of everything about the best that uh, Israel has to offer. So it's an hour and a half flight to uh, uh, Tel Aviv from Cairo. We'll explore old Tel Aviv and then we'll drive up to Jerusalem about a, an hour outside of Tel Aviv and we'll spend four nights in uh, Jerusalem. And you'll do all kinds of different things there. I mean, we'll visit Bethlehem. You'll see the tomb of King David. Visit the Jewish quarter, also the local market. But on one of the days, we're going to head outside outside the city, and we're going to go to a place called Masada. And Masada is a uh, Hebrew word that means fortress or castle. Um, and Masada, you can see it here, was actually the final site in the first Jewish-Roman war. And this is actually back in the day. 30 BC and so on, King Herod. This is where the elite went to get away from it all, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous, I guess. But Masada itself, look on the left-hand side, you kind of see something black sticking outside that side wall. And that's actually a cable car. So to get to the top of Masada, we'll take the cable car and we'll do a walking tour of Masada. And then out in the distance there, you can see a lot of water. Actually, that water is actually the Dead Sea. So we're gonna head down to the Dead Sea that's not me, but down at the Dead Sea to a resort. And the Dead Sea is famous for a couple of things. Number one, it's the lowest elevation anywhere in the world. It varies anywhere from 14 to 1600 feet below sea level. 
um, depending on the level of the sea. And the Dead Sea is famous because of its salinity, virtually impossible to sink in the Dead Sea. So we'll head down to a resort and those that want to get in the Dead Sea and do floating or swimming or whatever you like, the opportunity is there. Uh, those that don't want to, we are at a resort. We're going to include lunch at the resort and we'll spend a few hours there um, sort of relaxing. Um, maybe one of you may want to go to the spas and take advantage of the Dead Sea salts or muds or something like that. So that is, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, sort of the Egypt program. I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, but I know I don't want to take up too much of your time. And I still need to get over to our Africa program. So there is uh, Egypt. And then our second program we're gonna uh, talk about is Africa's Egypt and, uh, or sorry, Southern Africa, where we have our ship, uh, the Zambezi Queen. And our cruise down here in Southern Africa takes place on, on, a, on a river called the Chobe River, which forms the uh, border between Botswana, Namibia, and Zimbabwe. On our program, we start in Cape Town, we include the crews, we go to Victoria Falls, and then you get to split up and see um, a lot of highlights. And the ship, the Zambezi Queen, um, uh, it's an all suite ship. There's only 14 suites. The crew's local, they're actually Namibian. Um, they actually come from the villages around along the Chobe River and they work on the ship during the day. And then we have a kind of like a housing camp that they uh, sleep on at night on shore, but the captain and the engineer stay on board. The ship is an eco-friendly ship, air conditioned throughout, um, lounge, bar, splash pool. Um, actually, let's take a look at some of the things the ship has to offer. Number one, the crew, local Namibian and their smile is infectious. You just cannot not smile when you're on board the Nambi Queen. They love working with the Americans and uh, uh, they're grateful that we're there. Restaurant itself, I would call it five-star home cooked food. Um, the, the chef, she uh, comes from the village. Her and her son work in the kitchen. She's got her big knife in there. And um, she, great, she cooks great local as well as continental food. And you'll always get your choices uh, for food and we can always cater again to vegetarian, vegan and so on. Um, when you're on the Zambezi Queen, it is an open bar. So local spirits, local beer and local wine are always included uh, during your four night cruise on the Chobe River. Again, again, the smile and the food and stuff, I would call it the food, um, yeah, five-star home cooked um, home cooked food. It's really really good. So um, there's Moses. He runs the bar, and uh, again the open bar. Um, this is the relaxing lounge, and this is actually my background. And I have to be honest, I am a kind of a guy that keeps go go go. I don't know how to sit still. But once you're on the ship, it's pretty easy to sit still in terms of bring your zen down, I guess, to relax. By day two, you just say you're sitting on that couch looking out on the river and the wildlife and so on. Um, there is a feeling that you get that, I don't know, I've never really experienced before. And it's calm. And uh, it's like watching National Geographic except a trillion times better. On board the ship, of course, we have our splash pool. And uh, um, in that middle photo, you can kind of see the ship is over on the right-hand side of the river. And there's a reason for that because the, as I said, the river forms the border between Botswana and Namibia. In actual fact, the boat, because of its size, can only stay on the Namibia side of the river. Botswana won't let that size of boat on their side. So we'll cruise on the Namibian side, but in smaller boats, we'll head over into Botswana. And we choose, we cruise the Chobe River and its uh, tributaries and so on. It's not like a cruise you would do on a river or out on sea where every day is a new port of call. We're exploring about 40 square kilometers of uh, the Chobe River and its environs. The rooms, again, they were all suites. They're all air conditioned. I do no TV because your TV is the outside world there. Uh, there finally, we finally got Wi-Fi wi in the area. This is a pretty isolated area. And about two years ago, we got satellite Wi-Fi. I'm gonna be honest with you that a Wi-Fi here uh, works best on the top deck on a clear night in the evening. But that's part of the charm of being out kind of in the world, uh, um, kind of like in the middle of nowhere. Bathrooms, walk-in shower, hot and cold water, of course. 
the safaris, they're done in much smaller ships. So um, you can see the ship here where we do the safaris and see all those elephants. This part of the world in the Chobe um, is a, has the highest concentration of elephants found anywhere in the world in terms of density. So if animals are your favorite an, um, creature, this is where you want to come. Um, when is the best time to visit this part of the world? Usually from April down through November. And the reason for that is uh, the rainy season. It's not a rainy season. It's just like thunder, afternoon thunderstorms. It's December, January, and February. And we don't cruise that time of year. And when it does rain, the, rot, the river water is high and there's a lot of watering pools in Chobe National Park. But once the rains stop in February, the watering holes all dry up, the grass dries up, so you see more animals. And because the watering holes are dried up, all the animals have to come down to the river. And so you can see the safari boats. We usually put a uh, Zambezi Queen holds 40, 28 guests. We should put out eight or 10 guests on each safari vehicle. Most of our guests tend to stay on the, the lower level and don't climb to the top. And what's actually kind of fun, the boats are equipped with a little mini uh, restroom. So during the, your safaris in the mornings or the afternoons, there is a cooler there to help yourself to a glass of wine or a uh, bottle of beer while you're doing your safari, but you don't need to worry those, oh, there's a restroom if we're out too long. Here are some of the, again, some of the animals that you get on the safari. It's a different type of way to do a safari. And we're four nights on the river here. You see a lot of giraffes, my favorite animal. You see a lot of zebras, my second favorite animal. And actually the zebras themselves, up until about 20 years ago, they didn't realize that, you know, the great migration up in the uh, Tanzania with the wildebeest, they have a great migration of zebras in this part of the world. They didn't even know it existed until about 20 years ago. And so you're going to see a lot of zebras um, on your four nights on the Chobe River. Again, this is sort of kind of up close and personal. This picture here was actually taken by one of our guests back in uh, 2019 and she sent it to me. I just thought it was kind of crazy and I don't know what happened to the heron. Also, one day you will get off the ship um, and we will go in land and sort of do a daytime safari into Chobe National Park. And we will also have um, a picnic lunch in the park. And you'll also get the opportunity, we'll stop at a village and visit local villagers and stuff like that. So that's four nights on the Chobe River. But before we get up on the ship, we're going to start our trip in Cape Town, South Africa. And so from the US, you're gonna fly down into Cape Town. We'll meet you at the airport. This is a five-star program. Uh, you're transferred to the hotel um, in a Mercedes. Um, your medic baggage claim, you're handheld the whole way. Cape Town itself, four million people, always considered like the top 10 destination cities in the world. Um, culturally rich city. Um, people from all over the world have come to settle in Cape Town and so we'll meet you in the hotel we stay at Cape Town is the uh, Cape Grace Hotel. You can see there uh, that up on the right hand side. One of the best hotels, I guess, always rated in the top 10, uh, 100 hotels in the world. And it's right on the waterfront of Cape Town, very similar to like if you're in San Francisco and you go to the Embarcadero. The rooms here, uh, 90 rooms, our views of are the harbor. And you can see the room there on the left hand side. Three nights in Cape Town. I'm sorry, I'm rushing. I gotta, I'm trying to watch the time. But this is where you're going to go to the Cape of Good Hope. And the Cape of Good Hope, uh, many people think it's the southernmost spot in South Africa, but it's or in Africa, but it's not. And it's kind of like the south southwest North Point. But it's called the Cape of Good Hope because explorers from Asia on their way up to or traders up to Europe back in the 16, 17, 1800s, they kind of knew they were on the halfway point when they. Uh, reached the Cape of Good Hope. And, you know, they had hope to make it to their final destination. The left hand side is the Atlantic Ocean on that bottom left hand photo. The right hand side is the Indian Ocean. And what's kind of remarkable is that uh, the water on the left hand side of that point there is the Atlantic. The water comes up from the Arctic, Antarctic. It's 20 degrees colder than the water on the right side of that point where uh, the water is, the currents are coming in from the Indian Ocean. Another place we'll stop on uh, on this Cape of Good Hope is to Boulder's Beach. And what you don't think of South Africa for penguins, but about back in the 1980s, a bunch of penguins, I don't know how many, maybe 20, 25, washed up on shore uh, just outside Cape Town onto Boulder's Beach. And these penguins are actually 
I don't know, they took the wrong turn. They, they were from Antarctica and they ended up on this beach. And if you come to this beach now, um, 30, 40 years later, there are over 3,000 penguins on this beach. And so they've multiplied very, very quickly. They've adapted to their new landscape very, very quickly. In fact, they've evolved so quickly that they've actually now referred to them not as Antarctic penguins, but African penguins. And they're starting to move up the coast of Africa, Mozambique, and up into uh, Namibia. If you're looking for another documentary to watch in um, um, while we're at home, uh, my Octopus Teacher, another great documentary. It actually takes place on Boulder's Beach. And this came out about maybe five months ago. And this was the relationship of some guy in a, uh, a resident of Cape Town um, and his relationship with a octopus that lived off Boulder's Beach. And uh, it's a fascinating documentary. My family recommended it, friends recommend it. Um, I've heard a lot of people watch it two or three times. So this was a good way to escape from the world. Uh, uh, at least for uh, 120 minutes. Also, when you're in Cape Town, you'll have two choices. Uh, uh, you'll have a choice to go to the Winelands. And if you're really into wine, South African wine is uh, world famous. And uh, we'll go ahead out to the Winelands and you'll visit two wineries. Um, one's called Glen Alley, another one's called the Long Reach, which is an organic winery. And you'll also uh, get a chance to sample a tasting menu with different wines and spend a full day out there. Your other option is to head out to Robben Island and we'll tour the penitentiary. This is where Nelson Mandela was in prison during the time of apartheid. And there's a prison here now. The island's kind of been a kind of a prison for 400 years. Now it's a national landmark. And we'll tour the prison. And actually what makes it remarkable, I got a call like 18 months ago, uh, back in sorry, actually 2019, by a guy, his name was Christo, and he asked if he could take our group and tour and take us on the private tour of the prison. And I said, well, what, why? And he goes, well, I just want to tell you that Nelson Mandela and I, even though I was the warden in the prison and Nelson was in jail, we became good friends. And eventually Nelson Mandela became the president of South Africa and uh, still maintained his friendship with Christo until Nelson Mandela had passed away. So you'll get a tour of the uh, the prison with Crystal, and um, afterwards we'll visit Bocop. Bocop was the original uh, settling area of Cape Town back in the 1600s. They had brought slaves over from Malaysia, to build Cape Town, and this is where they lived. And uh, a lot of the Malaysians, the Muslim community, still here in Cape Town. Everybody gets the opportunity to go up on the cable car to the top of Table Mountain, and that cable car tours around and around and around. So you get to see a lot, and that's Table. Uh, that's Robin Island out there on the distance. So it's three nights in Cape Town, four nights on the cruise, and then you've got two nights in Victoria Falls, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. And you're gonna stay at the Victoria Falls Hotel, beautiful five-star hotel built by the railway. If you've been up to Canada and the Canadian Rockies and you see those big hotels, Banff Spring, Chateau Lake Louise, those were built by the railway, same concept here. And this hotel was built back in uh, 1925 by the railway to bring visitors to Victoria Falls. In Victoria Falls, um, we'll tour the falls. Um, we'll do uh, sort of a evening sunset cruises. Bring a historian in. We'll spend two full days of um, activities going on in Victoria Falls. And then after Victoria Falls, you have a choice of different doing different things. And one of them is to board the Rovis Rail, which is a five-star train journey from Victoria Falls down to Johannesburg. And it's four, three or four nights traveling through the African savanna. Um, seeing the animals. Uh, th this train was dates back to the 1930s and the 40s, luxury train travel. And uh, that's the way it is again today. They've uh, refurbished all the train cars um, and you travel as if you were traveling back like the lifestyles of the rich and famous again, back in the 30s and 40s. And it's pretty, um, you do have to uh, uh, dress up on the train for dinner. Men have to wear a coat and a tie, women a cocktail dress. Um, the rooms are private rooms with your own private bathroom. You can kind of see there that on the uh, right hand side. No Wi-Fi or cell phone service during your journey. They didn't have it in the 30s and 40s, so they don't think you need to have it then. But it is if you're a train buff or you just want to relax for three or four days, this is a great opportunity to see part of Africa. The other option is to 
head down to Johannesburg uh, for uh, two nights. And two nights in Johannesburg. Johannesburg used to have a bad reputation 20, 30 years ago, but now it's a city on the go. Um, thriving art scene, um, economic hub, one of the largest cities in Africa now. Um, and we'll spend two nights in um, Johannesburg at the uh, Fairlands Boutique Hotel. And again, it's a five-star hotel, kind of in the middle of Johannesburg uh, with a lot of uh, um, kind of like in a part-like setting. Actually, I didn't know this until this week, but this is where Jimmy Carter and his wife stayed when he flew to South Africa uh, to meet Nelson Mandela. The suites at the Chateau, uh, uh, the Fairlands Hotel, are called Chateau Suites, and each room has a different theme. Could be Asian, European, all different themes. So when you're checking into the hotel with the group, everyone's running around looking at different rooms to see what kind of room you got. Um, when we're in Johannesburg, we're actually going to visit Soweto. Soweto means Southwest Township, and this is where the rising of apartheid started. Apartheid again was where there was like a white government. It was like a five. They were the whites were like five percent of the population. And the colored and black were 95% of the population, but the whites, whites ruled the country. And they kind of told if you were black, this is where you live, these are the jobs you have. If you're white, you've got the best jobs and you have the best neighborhoods. If you're mixed, you live in this area and you get these particular middle of the road jobs. So one day I was with Lucky, our local guide, and uh, I said, Lucky, let's go somewhere nobody else goes. And uh, he took me to this place and I met Tulani. And that's Tulani there with the smile and that's Soweto in the background. And Tulani uh, grew up in Soweto and he started a youth center and small little school in Soweto. And um, he has kids that come to his school and he's getting the kids prepared to go on to university so that if they go to university, they'll get, a, you know, they'll get out of Soweto, they'll get a good job, you know, within a night neighborhood and so on like that. And uh, I remember I, when I met Tulani, I talked to him like for about an hour and he kept looking at his watch and I said, hey, Tulani, am I interrupting you? Um, you want me to go? And he goes, I'm sorry, Mr. Todd, I gotta go. I gotta catch a plane. I go, where are you going? He goes, Atlanta. And I said, Atlanta, what's in Atlanta? He goes, I have no idea. I've never been on a plane. But somebody nominated me for something called CNN Hero of the Year Award. And so CNN flew him to Atlanta. He didn't win but um, he got a first plane ride to Atlanta. And I asked him, I said, if there's anything gift people want to bring, if we come to visit your school in Soweto, what would you need? And all he said was umbrellas. And I said, why umbrellas? And he said, because the kids don't come to school if it's raining and they don't have an umbrella. So simple things like that. Okay, final documentary I'm gonna recommend is The Lion's Share. This takes place in Soweto. And you all know that song, The Lions Sleep Tonight. In the Jungle, the Mighty Jungle, that song originated in the 1930s in Soweto. And this is the history of the band and the family that started that song and how that song evolved over the decades to where it is today. That's all I can say, uh, tell you about, but you do meet the family today um, in Soweto from the you know, family members from the 1930s that you see in this photo. And from Johannesburg, we'll head over to Kruger National Park. This is where you'll see the big five, the rhinos, the lions, leopard, elephants, and uh, buffalo. And you have an opportunity for three nights to stay in these beautiful lodges and do day, morning and afternoon safaris. You have a choice of lodges, they're very small. They all come with either from anywhere from six to eight suites. And uh, some of the suites have their own private pool. Um, other rooms, others have a big um, balcony overlooking uh, planes and so on. Everything's included when you're at the uh, the lodge, morning, afternoon safaris, all your meals, all your drinks. The only thing I wouldn't be included uh, would be if you want to visit the spa. And these are the safari rides that you do. Everyone gets a window seat, of course. Or you can head up to Tanzania for a seven night uh, safari and you stay in really unique uh, accommodation while you're on safari for seven nights in Tanzania. You get to sleep in the treetops, five star, uh, living, sleeping up in the trees. This is where the, I guess the movie stars in the twenties, it was staying stuff like this. So it's really unique uh, accommodation uh, to stay at, uh, sleeping up in the trees. We'll visit a Maasai village, visit the Angorgo crater, which is a spectacular wildlife haven. Um, it's in a crater, an old volcanic crater. And you'll go down into the crater. It's about 2000 feet to get into the crater. And I remember once when I was at the top of the crater and I looked down, I didn't even know there was a lake there because it was completely pink. 
uh, with flamingos. It wasn't until I got down that I realized, oh my gosh, there's a lake there. And you also have the opportunity to stay out. Uh, we'll fly out to the Serengeti and stay two nights at a luxury tent camp. Um, this is where you see the Serengeti. And if any of you do want to see the, uh, the wildebeest migration or a chance to see it, there's never a guarantee. The best time to come to this part of the world would be uh, late July through the middle of September. Finally, there's the option to go see the gorillas in Rwanda, and that's our owners, and they were in Rwanda back in uh, 2019. Um, pretty uh, amazing trip. Christine, uh, Rudy's wife there in the photo on the left-hand side, when she came back to tell me about her experience, she actually started crying because she said it was probably the most emotional experience that she had ever entailed. The trek to see the gorillas, uh, they take anywhere from uh, 90 minutes to three hours. I've never really seen a three hour trek to see the gorillas. There's three families that live in this particular area that we go to in Rwanda. Um, they are uh, endangered and uh, the treks to see them are expensive, about $1,500 a day just to trek to see the gorillas. But it's something that you'll never forget. And uh, to see the gorillas, it costs a lot of money. They're trying to preserve the, uh, you know, save the gorillas because they, you know, they're on the verge of extinction. And the guides that you have, um, they're actually former poachers and they pay them a lot of money on the treks in order to, so they don't go back and start poaching again. So that's our look at Africa. And I hope I wasn't too long. Um, we do look forward to you coming back. Um, and I'm gonna pass it back to Mary Margaret again and see if you have anything you wanna say. Well, I guess I feel like I've been on a journey in Africa. I love it. Thank you so much, Todd. And you know, every time I, you know, I, even though I have Egypt on my bucket list, every time I hear your presentation, I feel like I've been there and I so look forward to going there again. Um, because you were part of this event this evening, if you book and deposit on any new 21, 22, and yes, I say 23, because we have 23 open, an Ama Waterways journey with your Birch Travel Advisor, by March 16th, 2021, I will uh, put a $100 per person discount on your invoice, okay? So with that, um, questions? Um, Mary Margaret, I'm gonna jump in, it's Gretchen. Um, uh -huh. While people, if they're thinking of questions or wanna put it in the chat, um, I can't thank you enough, Todd. That was spectacular. I feel like I watched a documentary. I learned so much. And of course, I just want to go so bad. I, a little sad story on my part. I had actually won a, a fantastic uh, trip to South Africa um, at our signature conference and was supposed to go. My husband and I were going to go of May, May of 2020. Well, needless to say, that got canceled. So yeah. it was just, we were going to be in Cape Town and Kruger. So it was kind of like I went there virtually with you. So thank you so much. It was really spectacular. And now I'm going to go with Ama because I, I'd love to be on that, uh, that river cruise, the Chobe River. So yeah. thanks again. Um, I just want to remind everybody, if you do um, have more questions, want more information, want to check availability, reach out to your Birch Travel um, Advisor or your Pegasus Travel Advisor. Best way to reach them is to contact them by, uh, via their email. We are in, the, uh, in our offices. Um, some of them are by appointment only, just for social distancing. We do have some um, limited hours. Most of our offices are open from nine to four. Um, so you can feel free to you know, call the office um, or just email your travel advisor directly. If you don't know the number or you just want to reach out to one of the locations, you can go to our website, birchtravel.com. Click on the locations tab and you'll see all of our locations there um, with uh, phone numbers, addresses, or there's also just a contact us form on there that you can complete, select which branch you want it sent to and we'll get it to an advisor to, uh, to reach out to you. Um, so keep dreaming everyone, we will be back, travel will be back, vaccines are out there. Um, and I think once that kind of, you know, gets out to, the, to just about everybody, we're seeing a lot of pent up demand and interest. So don't wait too long if you have some trips that you're excited to go on and um, thinking, oh, I'm not really going to go until 2022. Don't wait because everything is, people are getting anxious and they want to go. So we are um, here to help you. Um, 
Oh, thanks for the, the message there. It's, I don't know if you saw an awesome presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, it, it was fantastic. Have a great evening. All right, everyone. If you have any questions, give us a give us a ring at Burst Travel or Pegasus Travel. Thank you. Thank right. you. Bye, everybody. Good night. Bye.